You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up! Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports, powered by Overtime Media, I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me once again is your senior draft analyst at milehighhuddle.com. He is Eric Trick. We got one more day with Zach Kelberman being at game day inactive. And Trickle stepping in off the bench, rocking and rolling. He's he's one of those six men guys that might as well that should be a starter on the podcast. Eric, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good and just doing a bunch of work on the supplemental draft that's coming up here in about nine days, typically July tenth. Ooh. A few prospects that I'd be intrigued to see Denver go get, but I don't think they will. But I'm going to be doing an article on them anyways here soon. So, well, give us give us just a sneak peek as who you know the top guy you think the Broncos might be interested in. The best guy that I think would be the best fit for the Broncos is a receiver out of West Virginia, Marcus Sims. He's got that straight line speed. He's that deep ball guy. Great ball tracking. If People remember during before prior to the draft, I was high on Darius Slayton out of Auburn. Yeah, Marcus Sims is very similar in play style to him. That and Emmanuel Hall, like these deep these deep ball speed guys. That's what he brings. I mean, a couple other guys. I mean, Shyam Car- Colin from Syracuse. I keep saying Carter, but that's a corner from Alabama. Mm-hmm. He's a guy who's kind of an athletic, smaller linebacker. And then Jalen Thompson, who's more of that high safety coming out of Washington State. But Sims is the guy that I'm really looking at for Denver. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye out on that. Very interesting. Check for that article here at milehighhuddle.com this week sometime later on. But today what we're going to do is we are going to dissect an article published by yours truly on Monday evening that is basically projecting the impact of the Denver Broncos 2016 and 2017 draft classes under Vic Fangio this coming year. And we did this in the past with, uh, I think in May I published an article on the 2018 class projecting that. Zach and I broke it down on the podcast, went through it, and Eric and I are going to do that here today for you. But first, just really quick, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. That is the best way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Don't forget to leave a a like and a comment if you're on YouTube. And if you're on iTunes, we'd really appreciate you leave us a review and a five-star rating. All right, Eric. So, again, just a little backstory on this. Dead time, right? We're knee-deep in the dead time on the calendar. There's literally nothing going on. I mean, on Monday, for example, Emmanuel Sanders held his football camp and he made news by just saying the same thing he said a couple weeks ago, which is, yeah, I kind of hope to be back in week one, and we got to try and make hay with that, you know, as far as digital content. But it's nothing new. There's no news other than the Broncos, I guess, came out with their top 100. That, to me, top 100 lists, to me, Eric, are the epitome of uninteresting because they're, <laughs> I don't know, to me they always come off as arbitrary. What, are your, what were your thoughts, just real quick before we dive into this article, what were some of your quick thoughts I don't know if you got a chance to see that Denver Broncos top 100 list of all time, but what were your thoughts? I haven't seen it. I, I'm i uninterested in it just because everybody's going to have an argument for this player or that player. I'm sure it's a cool little list, but the only thing I've seen on it has been arguments about Tim Tebow, and I haven't seen it yet, but I personally don't think he'd be on it, but I know there's plenty of others who think that he would be. Yeah. So, I don't know. To me, they're interesting, but they're just – not my thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. So that came out as well on Monday. But uh, I had some time to sit down and do some analysis work, look at these two draft classes, of which there's only 10 players of those two different draft classes still on the roster heading into 2019 training camp, and try and project what their prospects are under Vic Fangio this year, what we can expect from a a role aspect, what kind of role they're going to play on, on on their respective units, what type of statistical impact they're going to have, what's the best case scenario. So let's go through these, and I want to get your thoughts on each one of these here. 
Eric, and let's start with the first guy, Adam Gotsis. Now, let's remember, Paxton Lynch would be the first guy on this list, but the Broncos cut bait with him on the doorstep of the 2018 regular season, so he didn't even make it three full years. The Broncos just said, let's call a spade a spade. This is a bust. Let's move on. So the next highest pick guy from that class, of course, was Adam Gotsis, taken in round two at pick 63. He is, I, mean, I think, you know, he's just like you predicted, Eric, when he came out. It was, he was raw, and it was going to be slow going for him. It took him some time to kind of develop and, you know, fit in, basically, find a way to make an impact. And, you know, he has started quite a few games before last year, but he really didn't begin to scratch that surface of his potential until kind of the second half of the season last year. And we really saw him, you know, break out in a sense in that Week 15 game against the Cleveland Browns where he had a sack, I believe, forced fumble. He had that huge fourth down stop that would have helped the Broncos win the game in the fourth quarter, but Case Keenum couldn't close. So it gives us some reason to believe that heading into a contract year, and by the way, all these 2016 draftees, they're in a contract year this year. But that, you know, that performance from God since the second half of the season, you know, it's at least cause to be optimistic that he's he's poised to have his best year as a, as, as a pro. So here's what I got as a projection for him in 2019 and then what his best case scenario is, and I want to get your thoughts. Projection, he's going to be the starting right defensive end. I predict he's going to have around 51 combined tackles, about 33 solo, and four sacks. Now, those four sacks, for what it's worth, would be a career high for Adam Gotsis. The most he's had in a single season was last year. He had three. Best case scenario for him, I don't project it best case being Pro Bowl or anything like that. Best case for Adam Gotsis would be a six-sack season, which would probably see him, Eric, earn you know some, some additional coin on the market next year. But what are your thoughts on that projection? Am I off base? I think it's pretty much in line with what we should be expecting from him, especially if he wants a bigger contract from the Broncos this year or any team. I think that the fact is, is he's a really good run defender, but we just haven't seen the pass rush, which is what the NFL is about nowadays. If you're not a pass rusher, you're only seeing the field for one or two snaps. And I know Snacks Harrison had a big old rant on Twitter about it, about the importance of run defenders a few, I think it was about a month and a half ago or so. But it just comes down to the fact that the game is going away from it. I mean, his numbers so far, they're not too far out of the realm of what you get for a from a run defending defensive lineman as a pass rusher. I mean, he's gotten, what, five sacks in the last two years, uh, 15 quarterback hits. So those are pretty solid, except that you want to see a drastic boost in the quarterback hit. Sacks are pretty fine. But, I mean, quarterback hits... 15 in the last couple of years, last few years, just isn't good enough. You won't typically want to see, at least from these guys, seeing about at least eight of them. So that's one way that he can get a boost up. Just being more consistent overall with his attack, having more of an attack plan. And I think this year is obviously it's a contract year. It's going to, it's a make or break year for him. And I think that if he, if he doesn't show the improvement with his consistency and a pass rush plan this year, I think then the NFL is just going to write him off as a pass rusher and just say, okay, he's at most a run defender, and that's what he is. Yeah. And, but pay, I, I like and, to, and pay him accordingly, right? Yeah, pay him accordingly, which they still make quite a bit of money. I think uh, I was looking at it because I was uh, aiming to do an article a few weeks back, but Bob actually beat me to it about kind of talking about – or maybe I did do it. I don't remember, but it was talking about project. It was projecting contracts for undrafted or not undrafted for unrestricted free agents after this year. Right. And I was looking at him for Adam Gotts and four players with his similar production, his similar skill set. They were still making about seven million dollars annually. So mm. he still will get a pretty penny, just not that eight, nine, ten plus yeah. million average. So, right. Yeah, if he wants to make Derek Wolf money, basically, which I think is is kind of a feasible ceiling for him in terms of his yeah. NFL, pot, you know, potential, he's going to have to show this year. That's why I've got him as a best case scenario getting six sacks, which would double his career high. But that would have some, you know give him some momentum in that sense heading into a contract year where his agent can be on the phone with NFL teams, including the Broncos, saying, "Look, my guy has finally turned the corner as a pass rusher, as an interior pass rusher. You know, show us the money." Now, this next guy, Justin Simmons, taken in the third round in 2016, 98th pick overall. I kind of look at him, Eric, as a jack of all trades, master of none. But it's not his fault. 
right? Last season, he played just about every position there is in the Broncos' defensive backfield due to some injury issues in the, in the unit and also just some misguided decisions by the coaching staff. If allowed to focus purely on being a safety and specifically a free safety, sky's the limit for this guy. I mean, the best-case scenario for, for Justin Simmons, we've been saying it, at least I've been saying it for the last two years, the best-case scenario is he's a Pro Bowl caliber talent. But he's just got to put it together on the field. And with Vic Fangio arriving, it might be the perfect storm of the stars aligning. If you kind of, it's 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 similar to the linebacker position for Vic Fangio. But if you follow his most recent stops in the NFL, including last his last one in Chicago, you see the safeties tend to have prolific production. I mean, Eddie Jackson last year, the free safety for that team. You know, I, I can't remember if he was All Pro, but I know he was Pro Bowl. Adrian Amos, the strong guy, he ended up getting a fat contract from Green Bay. So that's what could await for Justin Simmons. But he's got to put it all together. Here's what I got for him, Eric, as a projection. Of course, starting free safety, about 85 tackles. And that, I think, is actually shit selling it a little bit short. He he came down with 97 combined tackles last year. So he could end up with triple digits this year under Fangio. We'll see. Three interceptions, which would be a career high for him. What are your thoughts on my projection? Again, I I think they're pretty in line. I think the interceptions might be a little bit low for it, but not very much. I think tackles also just a little bit low, but I can get why. I mean, n- new defensive scheme and just some other question marks about the defense in general, then I, I can see it just being a little – going a little lower with the projections a little bit. Conservative. But that, yeah. yeah, conservative. But I definitely think that – he should be helped out this year. I do think that I would be looking at four or five interceptions from this year and looking at maybe 90 to 95 tackles at least, and definitely looking at a pro bowl. But that is if he's able to get more consistent in coverage and not make little boneheaded mistakes that he makes every now and then some that Vic Fangio should definitely help with. We should see, I mean, Justin Simmons, he looked quite frankly, the year that he looked his, the best with the most potential was his rookie year under Wade Phillips when he was being used correctly. Yep. The last two years, that wasn't the case. So Big Vangio, older school, defensive minded guy, but he's got enough of the of enough of the modern day defense in him that he's picked up along his time in the NFL that he should be able to bring that in, help Justin Simmons, use him to his strengths, and get the most out of him. Yeah. Man, I would love it if he were to get four, five, six interceptions. I mean, that'd be he'd be heading to the Pro Bowl. And he's got that kind of talent in him. I mean, he could get there. I mean, I could see that happening, but he's he's just got to be consistent. And, you know, hopefully the coaching makes a difference. And as you said, that's a great point. I mean, he played under a true defensive coordinator, one of the best in the league as a rookie. And that was the year that got everyone so excited about him. You know, even though he was the third safety onto the field behind – Darian Stewart and T.J. Ward. That's why everyone got so high on Justin Simmons was was because of that. So that's that's cause for uh, some optimism, I think, heading into his contract year under Vic Fangio. We'll we'll see how it shakes out. Yeah. Now, and go ahead. Sorry, real quick, just talking about that. His rookie year. I mean, if you just look at the base stats, they're very similar to 2017 and 2018. But you got to look at how many snaps he was doing. His rookie year, he played 31.2 percent of the snaps. And he put up similar numbers in as he did in 2017 and 2018, where he played 91.9 and 100 percent of the snaps. That's what's going to be. That's why I think that his rookie year was just the the best year of his career. Amen, brother. All right, this next one moving it along is Devonte Booker. He was the fourth round pick in 2016, and you know he probably would have been a second round pick had he not been nursing a an MCL injury heading into the draft. Most draft nicks considered in terms of the national media considered Booker to be the the second best running back going into that draft behind only Ezekiel Ezekiel Elliott. And Eric, you'll have to tell us. I can't recall now off the top of my head where you had him ranked, but you know. The future looked bright after his rookie year. He finished as the Broncos' leading rusher because C.J. Anderson suffered an injury in, I think it was week seven that season. He would go on to finish as the leading rusher. 2017, though, his second year, he just didn't take that step forward that the team expected, which is what necessitated John Elway not only spending two draft picks in 2018 on running backs, but also signing Phillip Lindsay. However, I think Booker took that as... 
he should have as a as a threat, as a shot across the bow, as an indictment of sorts. Because even though he was the Denver Broncos' third running back on the depth chart last season, he looked like a different player pretty much every time he was on the field. He finished with a career high and tied t- uh, Philip Lindsay for a team high in 5.4 yards per carry. He's never going to be the bell cow. He's never going to be that explosive player the Broncos had hoped. But I think he, he can be that between the tackles runner and receiver out of the backfield. Here's what I have for him, Eric, on a projection this year. As a Bronco in a contract year behind Royce Freeman, behind Phillip Lindsay, I have him at 50 carries, 250 yards rushing, two touchdowns, and then also hauling in 30 catches for about 216 yards and another score. Now, the total touchdowns, uh, now that I'm looking at it, might be a little too optimistic, but best case scenario for him is an injury above him and, you know, 500 yards rushing, five touchdowns, something like that. Yeah, when I was looking over it, I saw the touchdowns, and that's the thing that kind of stood out to me. It's a little, just a little bit optimistic for me. I mean, he in his career, he's only had seven touchdowns, and you're having him get almost half that. But uh, definitely there's a reason to be a little bit more optimistic because he showed us more last year than he ever did and it, in the rest of his years of his career. But the thing with his projections is that it's hard to say if they're good or not because – how much playtime is he going to get? That's my big thing with him is, is Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman, are they going to be able to stay on the field? Because if they're not, I think that the projections are a little bit more conservative in terms of carries and yards, obviously. Yeah. Not so much the touchdowns. But if they do stay if they, if they they do stay healthy and Philip, and Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman play all 16 games, I think they're pretty spot on with where we should be expecting Devontae Booker to end up. Maybe a little bit less in terms of yards for as a receiver and re- less catches because he's just good, basically going to come in and be that situational running back when Philip like when it's third down and Philip Lindsay is needs to just have a breather because for, for the most part you're looking at Philip Lindsay to be the third down back right otherwise Devonte Booker is going to come in and do that job so i think it's a little bit more than if where the, i think they should be if they play all 16 games but again, it's a little hard to do because there's that big unknown of what are we going to get out of Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman in terms of, well, more so how many games are we going to get out of them? Right. Yeah, that's the thing, man. It's hard to try and project what kind of production you're going to get from your third string running back. But, you know, and the one thing that Booker doesn't have, so to speak, going into this year that he's had last year, you know, everyone was excited about Royce Freeman. And by the end of the preseason, everyone was freaking stoked on Philip Lindsay. But everyone was like, yeah, you need Booker, though. You need him because he can pass protect, you know, and he can catch the ball yeah. out of the backfield. And he, even though he still has that going for him this year, you can say the same about Philip Lindsay now. You can say the same about Royce Freeman. I mean, frick, Royce Freeman had a hundred, uh, over 100 yards, or no, it was 10, 10 receptions in the season finale, which, or was it eight? Now I got to, now, now I'm questioning myself. I'm going to have to check it out real quick. But he had a lot of catches in that season finale. So it kind of minimizes the utility of Devontae Booker. But, yeah, it's just kind of hard to put your finger on what to expect when he's the third guy on the depth chart. Yeah, I do think that one thing that gets a little undersold with Devontae Booker is that he's pretty reliable. Not so much with holding the ball because he's had seven fumbles in his career, which is quite a bit when you break it all down about how many fumbles per touch. But what he is reliable at is that if you need if you need three yards, he's going to go get you three yards, pretty consistently. For the most part, he's picking up yards, and that's yeah. And I mean, his lowest year was his rookie year when he averaged three point five yards a rush. And basically, NFL people will tell you this is three point three is the minimum because three rushes at three point three, you're basically picking up a first down. Right. So and he's pretty reliable to go get you that. I mean, he's not going to go bust off huge plays. But he'll he'll get you that those three four yards basically every single time he touches the ball. Yeah, and for what it's worth, Freeman received ten recep or uh, targets, excuse me, in the season finale last year, and he caught eight of them, which was insane for a player like him who was not used as a receiver at all early on in the season. Now we move on. Let's get to Connor McGovern, who spent he was a fifth round pick in 2016. Spent his entire even though he made the 53 man roster out of camp, he spent his entire rookie year as a as a healthy scratch but going into year two you know he started showing some uh he he received extended opportunity because matt paris was coming off double hip surgery so he got 
he ran with the ones as the center that year, or at least that summer, excuse me, and then he started a few games late in the year at right guard, which allowed him in year three to kind of be grandfathered that starting right guard job, which I thought, for the most part, he, he did pretty well at right guard, especially early in the season. And then, of course, when Paradis went down last year, he moved over, started seven games at center, and again, I think he he more than held the fort down. I think at times he was very good, even though he was inconsistent too. Here's what I got for his projection, Eric. It's hard to you know. It's when it comes to projections for an offensive lineman, it's unsexy. You know, 16 game starter at center is what I got him as a projection. Best case scenario, he's a guy that can challenge similarly to Matt Paradis, where he's he's up there in the Pro Bowl conversation in a best case scenario. With the right coaching, Mike Munchak's being infused into this equation. He's in that conversation, but he's probably not, you know, one of these no brainers first ballot Pro Bowlers every year. He's a guy that if one or two or guys bow out or something, you know, as an alternate, he might get a chance. Yeah, I agree. I mean, again, as you said, projecting offensive linemen, it's not sexy because they don't they block. Like they're not out there catching passes. They're not out rush, running the ball. They're just there to block. So it's it's really hard to project them, and when you do, it's just not sexy. I think 16-game starter, I think that's, that's basically what should happen as long as he stays healthy. I mean, if he doesn't or if somebody else gets hurt, potentially we can see, like, say Ron Leary goes down, we could see Connor McGovern move away from center and bring Sam Jones in, but it all depends on what we see out of Sam Jones. But I think as long as Connor McGovern is healthy, he's going to be a 16-game starter and most likely all of them at center because, I mean, as I was talking about, if Ron Leary does go down, it would be better to fill right guard with a backup instead of moving your starting center and then replacing your center because your center is the one that's going to have the chemistry already built up with the quarterback. He's the one that's been snapping to him the whole time. You don't, you don't want to change that out unless you absolutely have to. So 16 game starting center, that's perfect. And then I think pro bowl alternate, depending on what Mike Munchak is able to do and what this offense, uh, what this offensive scheme is able to do. I think that's, that's a fair best case as well. Right. And it's not a bold prediction. I'm not saying that's what's in store for McGovern, but like, Based on his his skill set, based on all the factors, including coaching, the scheme he's going to be playing in, and all that, that's the best case scenario is a Pro Bowl alternate type of, of year. Now, here's the last one here before we take a break. Andy Janovich, fullback, drafted in the sixth round in 2016. And the Broncos, of course, took two backs in 2016, Booker and Janovich, one a tailback, one a fullback. And it was kind of crazy how, for Booker, his first carry – Fumble. Janovich, his first carry, 28 yards to the house. And at that time, all of us, I mean, we were like, yeah, because going into going into uh, that, that summer, we knew that Andy Janovich at Nebraska could be utilized as an actual offensive weapon. Like, he had that skill set. And to see him take his first carry to the house, 28 yards, I mean, we're not talking about a goal line touch, 28 yards to the house. It was like, man, the Broncos actually have – the potential for some offensive fireworks from their fullback, but neither Gary Kubiak, neither Mike McCoy, nor Bill Musgrave were ever able to really bring that to fruition. So he's basically just kind of been relegated to being that lead blocker. And I know, Eric, you've talked quite a bit about how most fans don't realize that he's quite inconsistent as a lead blocker. At times he can be very powerful, open up a huge lane. Other times he he can miss wildly. But I think this is the best opportunity for him in terms of the stars aligning because you've got Rich Scangarello coming over from San Francisco where they utilize the fullback as much more than just a lead blocker, you know, as a receiver, as a rusher. So if we're ever going to see Andy Janovich take at least a modest step forward in terms of being that weapon, I think in a contract year, this is his opportunity. Here's what I have as his projection. Of course, he's going to be the starting fullback when they do start with a fullback on the field. Five carries, 20 yards, something like that. 19 receptions, though, 180 yards, and one receiving touchdown. Best case scenario, Andy Janovich is the AFC's Pro Bowl fullback. That's the best case. Yeah, I think these I think these are fair. I mean, again, we have the offensive coordinator coming over from San Francisco where they utilize juice so much as an offensive weapon. And Andy Janovich, he's definitely flashed the ability to do that. We just haven't seen it with any kind of consistency and whether that is because any Janovich may not be able to do it full time or play calling, which I lean with play calling. 
just for the record, I lean that it's a play call and not wanting to utilize him as much, especially with the last couple offensive coordinators we had in Mike McCoy and Bill Musgraves, who neither of them looked capable of being an offensive coordinator in the NFL. But it's come. what my big thing is that, again, the inconsistencies as a blocker, sometimes he'll whiff badly on it and lead to a bad play. Other times he'll have that outstanding block that leads to a big play. I like to see that be more consistent. But as for the projections, again, you can't really project blocking stats but with what you can project for a fullback, I think that's really fair with the offensive scheme that's coming in play and coming from a the offensive scheme coming from a team that utilizes the fullback so much. Again, we've seen the flashes of it. Can he put it together consistently? That's the case. The irony is those two guys you mentioned, Mike McCoy, Bill Musgrave, neither one are currently employed in the NFL. So I think that tells I think that tells fans everything they need to know about why Andy Janovich has just not received enough uh, touches over the last couple of years. Now, we still have five other players, a couple more from 2016 and then uh, 2017 left to go here today. First we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> All right, Eric. So I lied. There's one left from 2016, and it's Will Parks. He was another six-round pick, Denver's second six-round pick that year. And, you know, he was also the second safety the Broncos took that year. And when the Broncos had Simmons and Parks hit the depth chart, I think most fans saw that as kind of a, you know, the, the heir apparent to the heir apparent duo, so to speak, to Darian Stewart and T.J. Ward eventually. And especially Simmons, as we've already talked about, had such a promising rookie year. Parks, his path's been a lot more meandering. However, last season was definitely his most consistent, even though it was far from perfect. He had several games in which he made some impact plays. I think back to that uh, game against the Steelers in which he stopped the the uh, tight end on the goal line and popped the ball out for a touchback. It was just such a – it's one of the best defensive plays I've seen since covering the Denver Broncos, and that's saying something. This year, heading into his contract year, just like Simmons, the stars are aligning with Vic Fangio coming in to kind of save the day scheme-wise, get him back to fundamentals, try and eliminate the mental lapses that have plagued Will Parks in particular. I have him projecting, and this is kind of weird because we don't know exactly how Kareem Jackson or where Kareem Jackson is going to fit into this equation, but here's what I've got on paper for Will Parks in 2019 as a projection. Starting strong safety, somewhere around 70 tackles, somewhere around two interceptions, which would be a career high. Each year he's been in the league, he's had one interception. So to double that under Fangio, I don't think that's that's pushing the envelope too far. Best case scenario, I don't see anything Pro Bowl worthy from Will Parks, although I wouldn't be completely stunned because of the track record Vic Fangio has. Best case scenario for me, for Will Parks, Eric, is a 16-game starter at, at strong safety. Well, I want to start off by saying I'm glad that you mentioned Kareem Jackson. I was just sitting here waiting for it. That was going to be my first point, is talking about the projection of him being, of Will Parks being the starting strong safety. That's hard for me to project because of Kareem Jackson. He's going to play some safety. He's going to play some corner. He's going to play in the slot. He's going to play all over. I think that's going to cut into it. I think it would have been, for me personally, if I'm projecting Will Parks, I would probably put him about 60% snaps and starting some games, not starting others, all depending on what team we're playing, but I think that he's going to see quite a few snap, a bunch of snaps actually on the defense, defensive side of the ball, over half of them. But I, it depends on also uh, the mental errors, as you hint on in the article, is that he's got to cut them back too often. Almost, almost every quarter he plays in, he makes at least one mental error, and it is typically a really bad one. Cutting that down will go a long ways to helping him and his potential. There's there, I mean, that goes with so that should go without saying. I mean, if you're constantly making mental errors at your job, cutting them out is going to help you do your job better. Simple as that. Yep. Now, again, it just comes down to with the projections overall. I think they're overly generous, or not overly generous. They're just a little generous. Optimistic, yeah. Yeah, a little optimistic. But it's not because anything to do with Will Parks. It's because of Kareem Jackson and his role. I think that he's going to cut into Will Parks' playing time quite a bit and kind of cut down those numbers a little bit. Um, I'd probably put him about 50 to 60 tackles, and but two interceptions, I think that's fair. I think that's that should be what we should be expecting from him anyways. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's that that all of what you just said is fair. We just don't know how Kareem Jackson is going to affect the, the playing time equation. If I'm Will Parks, though, 
you know, he's he's long been, including with F- Wade Phillips and Joe Woods, and then of course with Vance Joseph. He's a guy that coaches love, and so he's going to be campaigning for give me those starts, coach, so that when he hits free agency next year, he's he's got it on his resume. We'll see how well he does in terms of convincing his coaches to to at least be the starter nominally on all 16 games. But that's the absolute best case scenario for Will Parks. We'll see how it shakes out. Now, we got to move on to the 2017 class, of which it's been a bloodbath. I mean, there's only four guys left from the class still on the roster, and two of them we're going to talk about here. I don't even have making the 53-man roster as a projection. But let's start with the first-round pick, Garrett Bowles. Taken 20th overall. We all knew that year the Broncos were going to take a left tackle because they decided not to try and keep Russell Okun. So there's a massive hole at left tackle. And the question was going to be, was it going to be Garrett Bowles? Was it going to be Ryan Ramchick? And, of course, it ended up being Garrett Bowles. And I understand why. Not only because of scheme, but he literally blew up the combine as a left tackle. He just did really, really well at the combine. And you, you can probably speak a lot more to that, Eric. But... His first year, he basically, his rookie year, he was grandfathered a starting job and it blew up in the Broncos' faces. They just didn't have another option is is really what it boils down to. He finished the year, if not the most flag player in the league, one of the most flag players. I can't recall exactly off the top of my head. And his second year, 2018, wasn't a heck of a lot better, but he did finally down the stretch show some restraint, started showing more discipline, progress in other words consistency even though there was a couple lapses still he showed better consistency down the stretch which i think with munchak arriving you know you you can get some some a streak of optimism that garrett bowles is finally gonna you know show show that draft pedigree because he's got first round talent of that i don't think the broncos were wrong i think they just miscalculated exactly how raw and exactly how exactly what Bowles' temperament was because they they knew he was kind of a loose cannon. I mean, Elway joked about right after they picked him, we can't wait to see him and Derek Wolf go at it in training camp. I mean, they knew he was kind of a fiery guy, an emotional player. They knew that, but I I think they miscalculated or at least underappreciated his lack of discipline. And it's not in his work ethic. He works hard. Don't get me wrong on that. I mean discipline in terms of honoring his technique, snap in, snap out. He just he just lapses. So here's what I have as a 16-game, or as a projection. He's a 16-game starter at left tackle. If everything, and I mean literally everything, comes together with Mike Munchak, he's a Pro Bowl caliber player as a best-case scenario, but by no means, Eric, am I saying that's a prediction. Yeah, I, I think that with Garrett Bowles, it's basically getting him to start all 16 games is basically right where it should be at. I mean, we know his issues that he's had over the last few years. You've touched on it, the issues with the penalties and just the issues with bad plays. And I went back and I was watching over them a couple months ago. It might've been just right after the season was over, but basically every single bad play that he had where he gave up a bad sack, the play before it, was something that was either he got flagged for or something that was bad, was a negative for him, but not nearly as bad. Interesting. He's very emotional, and it's very much in his head. He makes a mistake, and he doesn't just he doesn't have short-term memory. It sits there, and it affects his play for a few plays more until he gets off the field and is able to get calmed down. That's something that I think really hope that Mike Munchak's able to work with him on, just getting that short-term memory and – see him get just kind of mature a little bit as a player. And I'm not going to, I don't want to sit there and harp on him about his cartoon watching and always wanted to be up watching Saturday morning cartoons, eating bowl of cereal, which I've heard is a big thing with him since I do that. But you got to realize that he's got to realize anyways, that he's in the NFL, that sometimes you got to put in a little bit extra work. You got to put that, you got to turn off the TV of the cartoons and go dig your nose into the playbook a little bit or go meet with another offensive lineman or go meet with somebody or go work on your own technique a little bit by yourself, go do something and turn off the cartoons, not trying to be too harsh on him, but it's make it or break it. This is the year for him. Either he does well enough to continue to be the left tackle or he's gone. It's simple as that. I mean, next year's offensive tackle group in the draft is pretty solid at the top, provided they Provided they all declare, because a bunch of them are underclassmen. But if they do, you can't keep him. If he has another bad year where he doesn't 
finally put it all together or at least show signs of really putting it all together and not just stepping his play up towards the end of last season like he did, but being more consistent, not letting the mistakes eat at him, all that. He's got to do it, and this is the year for him. 16 games starting left tackle. I think that barring an injury, that's going to be a given because right now they don't have a backup left ta- left tackle, really. Jawan James, people are more optimistic about his ability to play left side than I am. I'm not wanting to put Dalton Reisner there. I'm not wanting to put Chaz Green there. I'm not wanting to put Elijah Wilkinson there. Basically, he's the only left tackle they've got. Because of that, I think that 16 games starting left tackle, that should be a given. Uh, Pro Bowl, definitely a best-case scenario for him. All right, here we go. We move on to the second round. Demarcus Walker taken uh, with the 51st overall pick. Eric, we don't need to go into all the nitty-gritty on the podcast, but suffice to say that was quite a shock, I know, to you as a as a draft expert <laughs> that the Broncos took him in the second round. And, you know, there's questions about his scheme fit. There's questions about his – Effort. There's questions about an entitled kind of attitude. I mean, his his Twitter handle is Living Legend 44. I mean, that's how the guy views himself, and yet he's appeared in just 13 out of 32 possible games as a pro. So I'm hoping that reality has set in. I'm hoping Vic Fangio can help him understand the reality of his situation that he is, especially with Draymond Jones hitting the roster very, very much on the roster bubble. It's put up or shut up time for Demarcus Walker. Best case scenario, obviously, is that he makes a 53-man roster. But my projection for Demarcus Walker is that he gets waived at the final roster cutdowns. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't have him making the roster. Basically, Jamon Jones is there. He took his job. And I know he's a former second-round pick, but there was a lot of stuff behind that that I don't want to get into. Just errors from of coaching, just him getting ill, losing weight, injuries, his time in Denver has been kind of plagued. I think that there is still potential for him in a certain role. I don't see it in Denver. I don't see him making the roster. I wish him all the best. I wish that he's able to get his attitude in check and just kind of calm down a little bit and not be as arrogant and, and egotistical as I've heard he is. And better luck elsewhere. I don't I don't think that he makes the roster this year no matter what, basically. I think if he has a good preseason, I think they're going to look to trade him. If he has a bad preseason, preseason, then obviously he's cut. Yeah. Yep. We'll see how it shakes out. I mean, do you think real quick, very quickly here, because we got two more to go and we're, and we're running a little bit long. Do you think there's any merit to the idea that he is a better scheme fit, maybe not perfect scheme fit, but at least a better scheme fit under what Vic Fangio is probably going to run in terms of that four, three under look? He, he is a little bit better of a scheme fit in the 4-300, but it just comes down to the fact that Draymond Jones will do exactly what Demarcus Walker does, and Draymond Jones was a pick of this staff, not a former failed staff. So right, right. while he is a better one, the other circumstances in there, just I don't, just don't, I don't think that it helps him any. It gets even worse because the Broncos have already waived their first of second, of, excuse me, their first of two third-round picks, and Carlos Henderson, he got waived last year. Brandon Langley is right behind him. Technically, he was waived as well, obviously. And as a rookie, this was another strange draft pick the Broncos reached. He had no business, I write here in this article, Brandon Langley, going in the third round, even as a compensatory selection. And he proved that when he was on the field as a rookie. Pretty much every time he was on the field, opposing quarterbacks went after him. And you expect to see that. You saw that with Isaac Yadam. You saw it with Kayvon Webster back in the day. You even saw it back in the day with Chris Harris, Jr., Opposing quarterbacks are going to look for the most experienced corner. They get their scouting reports every week. They get they do their game prep. They have their game plans. And when Langley was on the field, opposing quarterbacks went after him, and he was just exploited time after time after time. Heading into his second year, you know, the Broncos, cautiously optimistic that he would take a, that next step, failed to do so, and so they waived him at the final cutdowns to 53. Goes unclaimed, so they re-sign him to the practice squad. He stays there for 11 weeks. And then when injuries decimated the unit, they called him up, and he spent five games in uh, his second year on the active roster. But then, lo and behold, heading into year three with his future very much up in the air but still under contract and controlled by the Broncos, he decides, with the team's blessing, to switch to wide receivers. So I'll let you kind of lay out, Eric, what the path ahead is for, for Langley. I have him as his projection being a wave at the final roster cutdowns. I don't think he's going to make it. 
best case scenario is he makes it as a 53-man roster guy, but as like the sixth receiver on the depth chart, basically bringing up the rear as a returner. Yeah, I think that, well, I don't think that he was a reach per se, simply because I heard a bunch of other teams that were picking not long after Denver were going to take him. It's definitely an issue of hindsight that you can see now that he was overdrafted. And and for me, he was a reach. But I say the reason why I'm kind of hesitant to say that is because it's obvious that teams love raw athletes. We have seen it time and time again. Raw athletes go a lot higher than they possibly should because they're raw and athletic and you can teach you can teach players how to play football, but you can't teach football players how to be athletes. That's what the case was here with Langley. I think that I think him moving back to receiver because that's what he originally entered college as was a receiver is better for him. I think that his speed is going to be able to be showcased better there. And I do want to say, even though that his time at cornerback over the first couple of years of his career weren't great, he actually showed up really well as a special teams player. I consistently over the, his games noticed him on special teams doing the right thing, especially as a returner. And I think that that will help him because if you're looking at a guy at the bottom of the depth chart, they've got to be able to play special teams. I think his speed is going to bring something that the Broncos offense lacks being able to go get that deep ball. As long as he's able to get underneath those balls that Joe and Joe Flacco doesn't overthrow him 70 yards downfield, but it's definitely a long road ahead of him right now. All he is, is he's speed. That's all he is. He has none of the finer nuances of being a receiver. The route running is hit and miss. He's got to work on his fakes and his jukes and his routes and being able to get get defenders to bite on different things, on different moves out of there to help him get space, to help him get open, things like that. Yep. It's definitely a long road ahead of him, but outside and outside of the top four receivers, I mean, you have it all up in the air. But I think that if he really wants to make this roster, he has to show up on special teams and as a returner. I think that's going to help him the most because you can keep him as a returner while you continue working on him as a receiver, but he's got to show that before anything else. And it's probably because of that special teams acumen that his odds of making this roster are probably better than Demarcus Walker, even though Walker's a second round pick. Yeah, I agree. And I think that another factor that is not just special teams play is, but that there is no obvious replacement for Brendan Langley right now. I mean, the other speed guys that the Broncos really have sitting in the wings are all undrafted rookies. So they don't have that speedy deep threat, really. They have other. They have the route runners. They have the guys who can go up and get them. They have those kind of receivers, but they don't have that speed deep threat, which also is another reason why I think that he's more likely to make the roster than Demarcus Walker. We'll see how it shakes out. Last guy here remaining from 2017 is Jake Butt, taken in the fifth round. Most draft Knicks, Eric, I'm not sure off the top of my head what your thoughts were on this, but had he not suffered his... ACL tear in Michigan's bowl game. Common consensus was leading up to that game, he was probably going to be an early day two pick. But he ended up being there in the fifth round. The Broncos took him, really just banking on the upside of let's get him healthy and we think we've got a gem here on our hands. And it really appeared heading into last year after he redshirted his rookie year, heading into 2018, it looked like that's kind of the direction it was going before tragedy struck once again and he suffered another ACL tear, the third of his football career, in between weeks three and four during practice. Heading into 2019, here's the one thread of optimism in terms of Jake Butt finally putting those bad luck days behind him. He talked about on Denver Radio a few months back, I think it was in March, that the surgeon who operated on his knee this third time discovered when he was in there that the notches that these ligaments connect to in the knee. I'm not an expert, you know, so I I can't probably elucidate it perfectly here, but that they were extremely narrow. And what that was doing was causing undue friction and pressure and torque on his ligaments, which over time led to an increased, you know, likelihood of of tearing them. And that's how it shook out. So what these surgeons did was they kind of scoped out those notches to free up the ligaments you know, create more room so that he's not as likely to tear. Who knows? That's what he said. Who knows how it shakes out in reality? Uh, it's looking like he's going to be able to participate in training camp relatively soon as a full go. Here's what I have projected for him. 25 receptions. I do have him making the roster. I think he'll he'll get through the summer, and I think he'll make the roster. 25 receptions, somewhere around 265 yards and a touchdown as a full season's worth of stats. 
I think, Eric, this is my opinion, all things being equal, you take away injury concerns. From a pure talent perspective, I think he is the best tight end on the roster, not named Noah Fant. The best case scenario for Jake Butt this year, I think, is being the tight end two behind Noah Fant. But at the same time, the Broncos are paying Jeff Hireman, you know, his cap number is something like $3 million this year, or just shy of that maybe. And so in terms of a best-case scenario for Butt being tight end two, that would entail not only him outshining Hireman, but Hireman probably suffering some kind of an injury himself, which is, based on his track record, extremely likely as well. Yeah, I got to say that you're being a little bit generous, I think, for his best case and his projection. I think his best case would that we see him play at least six games. And that his projection is three games before he gets hurt. <laughs> now, I, I'm just kidding on that. I think that I, I really do hope that he's healthy because he was my number. I had to actually look this up. But his, my, he was my number 84 overall prospect and my number five tight end, number six tight end. So I really thought highly of him going in, even with the injury. I still thought highly of him because of what he has shown on what he showed on the field before the injury. Obviously, I knew he was going to fall a little bit because of it. And I think that I th- really thought that Denver got a little bit lucky. Now I think that Denver wishes they had a time machine, then they can go back and put down George Kittle's name instead of Jake Butts. Oh, yeah. But I, I like Jake Butt. I think that this year, hopefully we're finally able to see him all put together. And I hope that the cleanup that the doctor did with his knee, finding out what the issue was and all that, and able to take care of that is really going to help out. He definitely showed flashes last year as a receiver tight end as a blocker. You've got to be able to do that. And I don't see that with Jake, Butt still. So I kind of question how is he going to fit in because you already have Noah Fant, who's that receiver, but the type of receiver they are is very different. But I definitely do think that as long as he's healthy, he's definitely starting out behind a little bit. He can come in and he can fight and he'll compete for that tight end number three spot. And I think that depending on how he does, he could definitely take over that number two tight end spot because Jeff Hireman, while he has a 3.1 cap hit this year, Denver can cut him or trade him after June 1st. And if they trade him after June 1st, trade him during training camp, they only eat 500,000 dead money this year which would free up some extra money for in the season, or they can cut him. And it, I mean, it kind of equals out, but it's 1.5 million dead that they have to eat and 1.6 plus that they free up, which still helps them out a little bit, frees up a little bit more than half of what they were having on the books to keep him. So I think that's something to keep an eye on as well, especially with the other tight ends that are standing up. But as for the projections, as long as Jake Butt is able to stay healthy, I think that actually, honestly, I think that they might be a little bit conservative. I would be looking at him at getting about 30 to 35 catches with about 300 yards and one touchdown personally. Okay. Well, you heard it. Two guys going over an article. Uh, you know, there's probably a couple of things here I might reconsider if I were to rewrite this thing, but it's out there. It's live. Go read the article. Check it out. And also, make sure you follow Eric on Twitter. It, Eric Trickle, spelled E-R-I-C-K-T-R-I-C-K-E-L. Great follow, especially heading into training camp. You're going to want to keep tabs on his analysis and his thoughts on how the Denver Broncos are taking shape. And we'll, of course, work to get him back on the show as often as we can. And I know he's got some things cooking down the road to uh, start contributing also to the podcast we're doing week in and week out. So stay tuned for that. And once again, Eric, thanks for filling in for Zach at this Last week or so, it's been great being able to podcast with you, hang out, and talk football. Man, thanks for having me. I forgot how much I missed podcasting after shutting down Trickle Down Theories for a while, simply for time reasons. I forgot how much fun I actually have just sitting here talking Broncos for half hour to an hour every day almost. Yep. It's just another way that we can kind of exercise our our own uh, football demons in the best sense. So. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to down the road here, hopefully not too far out. We won't spoil what's in the works, but we'll get Eric injected back into our, our podcasting equation. But that's going to do it for today. You guys, make sure you're following the show as well, at Huddle Up Pod. You can find my podcast partner, Zach Kelberman, on Twitter. He'll be back tomorrow, at Kelberman247, myself, at Chad and Jensen. Again, don't forget to follow Eric as well. And uh, there will be a fresh episode of Building the Broncos waiting for you on Wednesday. And then Zach and I will be back with a fresh episode day after that. So in the meantime, be good. For Eric Trickle, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.